Today I want to speak to you about what happens when your source dries up. What happens when your source dries up? And I want you to turn with me to the book of 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 27. I preached about this passage a few years ago when we did a, uh, a small group study on a book by Stephen Furtick about the life of Elisha. And the Lord brought this passage back to me because I really believe it's where we're at right now. I kind of feel it in my spirit that we're preparing for our comeback. I feel it in this room right now that we're preparing for our return. I feel it in your life right now that God's about to unleash you into another level. And in preparation for that, I believe we have to prepare the way. This is the portion of scripture where the prophet Elisha uh, encourages the people to dig the ditches that the rain will come and fill those ditches so that they can have provision. And it's funny because sometimes God will ask you to do something in a time when it doesn't look like it's going to rain. And I believe, I'm speaking to somebody right now, your time of sequestering, your time of quarantine is about to end. God is eventually, I'm going to tell you something, we're going to be past this and, and I want to be ready. And the time to prepare for what's next is not when what next comes. The time to prepare for what's next is to do it right now in Jesus' name. But what happens when you do it and your source is dried up? I want you to look with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 3, verses 1 through 27. I'm going to read a majority of it because I want you to get the story in your heart. It says this. It says, Joram, the son of Ahab. Let's just stop right there. Ahab was the husband of Jezebel. And how many people know if your son brings home a girlfriend and says, Hey, Mom, uh, this is my girlfriend, Jezebel. Uh, shut the door, grab your son, and say, Listen, honey, you, you may be related to the Pope, but you ain't marrying my son. Get thee behind me. And if, if you want to marry my son, that means legally change your name. Because how many people know Jezebel ruined it forever? You understand what I'm saying? She was one of the most ruthless people on the face of the earth that with just one word from her mouth, she can even send prophets into, into depression. She was somebody who transformed a kingdom based on her manipulation. And so that's the son that we're talking about right now. So it says that Joram, the son of Ahab, became the king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jeroboam, the king of Judah. And he reigned 12 years. And listen to this. It says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father or mother had done. Ooh, wait, relief. You mean, you mean Joram, he, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but, but not as bad. How many people know when it comes to God, not as bad doesn't count? There's a lot of people think, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. No, you're either in line with the word or you're not. Let's keep going on. He got rid of the sacred uh, stone of Baal that his father had made, and nevertheless he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He did not turn away from the Lord. It's important that you need to understand. Let me stop there so this way we have a little break in the scripture because I'm going to read a lot to you. When you choose to cling on to something God has asked you to release, you will never go far. What are you clinging on to today that you need to release? Some of you are clinging on to something that used to be what God gave you, but now it's no longer his season. You cannot, you cannot, uh, you cannot cling to something God has asked you to release because it will never end well. Static cling. Come on. How many of you have ever had a sock in your pants because of static cling? And then somehow you're out with your friends and all of a sudden you're shedding a sock down your leg. Clinging never works. You can use that. Now Misha, the king of Moab, raised sheep. And he had to supply the king of Israel with 100,000 lambs and with the wool of 100,000 rams. But after Ahab died, king, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So that at that time, King Joram set out from Samaria and mobilized all Israel. And he also sent messengers to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. The king of Moab had rebelled against me. Will you go fight against Moab? And Jehoshaphat says, I will go with you, he replied. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. By what route shall we attack, he asked. Through the desert of Edom, he answered. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And after a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. And now let's take a break so this way you can get some perspective here 
uh, there was a deal between this king that he would supply the sheeps and the ram's wool so that they can make an offering to the Lord. They needed to do it two times a day. I'll talk about that more later. But the Bible says that they, the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom formed an alliance to go and get this resource back because once again, the resource dried up. What they needed for their offering dried up. And so now they go into war, but the Bible says they went in a roundabout way. They went in a roundabout way. They were spinning their wheels. It's kind of like the scripture. In vain, you rise up early and you go to bed late toiling for food to eat. But the Lord grants sleep to, hear, to those he loves. So what it means is that for seven days they wasted their time. For seven days they depleted their resources. For seven days their strategy amounted to jack squat. And they found themselves to the point where they were out of food, they were out of water, and they were about to die because they were in the desert. And then they come to the point where they said, maybe we should ask God. Isn't it funny how in this situation, they, they got angry on their own. They wanted justice on their own. They, they determined that they would make an alliance on their own. And then they come to the point where they've, they've set out for seven days on their own. And now when everything is gone and they had no other option, they asked God. How many people know it's not when you run out of options, it's before any option you need to ask God. It's not, it's not before, you need to ask God before everything. Ask him before, don't wait for things to run out. Don't wait for the rug to be pulled out from underneath you. You've got to ask God before, he's before all things. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Because when you don't seek God, you run out of resources, you run out of time and you run out of energy, you run out of hope. God's not the last resort. He should always be the first ask. And so it says, What exclaimed the king of Israel? Has the Lord, this is verse 10, Has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water into the hands of Elisha. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. That's funny because as a king, as a king, the king should have known who the prophets were. And they didn't. Now, who were the prophets? The prophets were the people that spoke the word of the Lord to the people. There's a lot of people, when all hell breaks loose in your life, you go to every person, but you forget that this word is here for you. It's funny, there's a lot of people who are in the middle of hell right now, and they're looking, is there a prophet here? Wait, wait a minute, let me turn on TBN. Surely... Bishop Jakes has a message for me. Let me listen to Furtick. Surely Furtick has a message for me, Pastor Furtick. Let me turn on, let me turn on Dom. Since I called Furtick Furtick, let me call me Dom. Let me turn on Pastor Dom. And let me see if he's got a word for me. Oh, uh, uh, Pastor, are you on Monday nights? Because we really need our spiritual fix on Monday nights. We can't make it throughout the day without you being on to pray for us on Monday nights. Is there a prophet that's on Tuesdays since you're not on Tuesdays? Who else can we go to for our fix? There's so many people who God has ordained you to be kings, but you don't even know that your answer is right here in the word. But how many people know even when we don't know God has his grace? There's always, there's always somebody who will speak into our lives. And I've got to believe this morning is that. And if you think I'm speaking at you, I'm speaking to me too. We're all in this together. How many of you are strung out and stressed just being stuck in the same house all day long? How many of you are strung out in stress that, about your economic issue or about the health of a loved one or about your own health yourself? And we, we're in the middle of a battle and we forget that the answer's right here. So they go and they speak to the prophet. Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do we have to do with each other? Remember, this was his mentor's arch enemy's son. It's like me saying to a Yankee fan, what do we have to do? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do we have to do with each other? 
go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Pretty much he's saying, go, go read your horoscopes, bro. Go, 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 go to the prophets of Baal, bro. If Triple H, this is for Al Scott and Matt, would have make a re <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go to your prophets. And uh, no, the king answered Israel, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to hand us over to Moab. Elijah said, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look down at you or even notice you. But now bring me a harpist. And while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. How many people know worship changes the atmosphere? There's going to come times in this season where people you can't stand are going to come at you for help. And the first thing you're going to want to do is going to be like, yeah, you know what, get away. But worship changes the atmosphere. And then it says this. It says, bring me a harpist. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. And he said, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches, for this is what the Lord says. You will, neither, you will send neither wind nor rain. You will see neither wind nor rain. Yet this valley will be filled with water, and you and your cattle and your other animals will drink. And this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord, and he will also hand over Moab to you. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop up all the springs, and ruin every good field with stones. And the next morning, about the time of the offering, remember the time that they were supposed to offer something that they were running out of. Let me say it again. About the time that they were supposed to offer the last sheep, God showed up and gave them resources so that they could fight the battle and get back what they needed. What are you doing when your source dries up? The next morning, about time of the offering, the sacrifice, there it was, water flowing from the direction of Edom, and the land was filled with water. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say amen? I hope you're taking notes because we're about to go to work. Are you ready? Here's the background. Elisha has just become the new prophet in town. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. And just like your pastor, Elisha was bald. As the mayor, as the president of the bald community. Come on, if you're bald and you're proud of it, type it in. That's right. We're with you in the bald community. Come on, yeah. All my bald people, just say amen. If you're bald and you're beautiful, make it bold. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to come up with a rhyme. You don't really need to type in that you're bald. But here's the deal. The kingdom of Israel is now in a downward spiral. It was split into two. And after the reign of Solomon... And repeated bouts with idolatry and pagan worship and compromise, we see that Joram becomes the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, replacing Ahab, the worst king of all time. And we see Jehoshaphat was the king over the lesser, evil, still compromised southern kingdom. And now enters the Moabites and their king, Misha. And... Um, we see here because of an agreement, he was the one who raised sheep, and due to an agreement that preceded these kings, he would supply the king of Israel with 100,000 lambs. I understand that you're trying to like follow this sermon, but you need to understand what this source was. There was an agreement with the king of the Moabites that preceded any of them where the Moabites would, would give 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams after the death of Ahab. And the king revolted against these agreements. He said, you know what? I'm tired of being the sucker. I'm tired of paying up. Enough is enough for closing. We're going to start a trade war. You think it's just now? <laughs> it was even back then. And the major point of this passage is that Israel's source dried up. Now, I, I want you to understand, this was not just about Israel's food or their wool so that they could make some clothing. In Exodus 29, 38 and 39, you need to understand this because it's not just about digging the ditches, guys. I want to give you a little context, and then we're going to build up on it, okay? It says this. It says, it says in Exodus 29, 38 and 39, it says an offering was to be given to the Lord every morning and every evening. That means that every morning and every evening, they needed to take two lambs a year old, one in the morning and one at twilight, and offer them to the Lord. 
And this went on even in the times of Israel's apostasy. So you need to understand that when Moab said, I'm not giving you any more lambs, it was equivalent to your job saying, we don't need you anymore. It was equivalent to saying, we're downsizing the company and we no longer need your position. You see, Israel was in a place now where they knew that God required of them every morning and every night. You know, that it was funny because they were living in, in spiritual idolatry, but yet they were still holding on to a little bit of God. And this was the last thing that they had almost. And, 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 and Israel was saying, listen, if we don't have this, we are down the creek. How are we going to provide for the sacrifices when the source of how we give the sacrifices is about to dry up? Like some of you, when I'm, get, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm talking about the, the tithes and the offering, you say, this guy's got some nerve. How's he asking us to give to the church when we don't even know if we're going to get paid next week? Because your source has never been your employer. And Israel's source was never the king of Moab. You see, you see, God asked for this offering long before there was an agreement with the Moabite king to provide the sheep. And I'm telling you, he's Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Can somebody type it and say it? Amen, he's my provider. But here we see Israel, it wasn't just the source of their offering, it was the source of their sustenance. And here's a point for you. What do you do when your source dries up? What do you do when the job dries up? What do you do when the income dries up? What do you do when the healing dries up? What do you do when the hope dries up? What do you do when the affirmation dries up? What do you do when the compliments dry up? Oh, now, come on, I'm coming into your house and I'm stepping on your picky toe. What do you do when what you so desperately need to be sustained is dried up? Because some of you have money, but you don't have encouragement. Some of you have money, but you don't have hope. Some of you have everything that you think you can need tangibly, but you have nothing emotionally. What do you do when that emotional sustenance dries up? What do you do when the finance dries up? What do you do when those things dry up? When those things dry up, you've got to look up. Moving on in the story. We see the king of Jorab was, we see King Joram was a little better than King Ahab. <laughs> Now, how many people know, and this is what I got to tell you, stop comparing yourself and your faithfulness to God by other people. Well, you know what? <laughs> At least I don't curse. <laughs> At least I give in the offering. I may not tithe, but at least I give. Man, pastor just asked, text this, and I, $20, I'm good. At least, at least I'm not giving nothing. At least, at least I'm not cheating on my spouse. At, at least I'm, you know what, I'm not as bad as that guy over there. I'm good. And how many people know that's the first ploy of the enemy to get you to compare yourself? Because to compare yourself with someone who is lesser gives you a false sense of obedience and security. And to compare yourself to someone greater, oh, look at Genesis. Look at Genesis over there in her Telly the Monster from Sesame Street fleece, all purple and cuddly, all behind the computer. Look at Genesis. She's at school doing papers. I can't even do school right now. She's so much better than me. I'll never be able to be as holy as Genesis. And here's the deal. God has not asked me to compare myself to somebody underneath me, and God has not asked me to compare myself to somebody who looks like they're doing better than me. God has asked me to live by his word, to humble myself before him, and he will lift me up. And you've got to understand, a little bit of obedience is no obedience at all. That would be a good time for somebody in the church to stand up and be like, oh, mmm, little T.D. Jakes, mm, 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 mm. You're either all in or you're not. And some of you are saying, Pastor, come on, we need, a, we need a word. We need a word of encouragement, Pastor. Hold our hands like you did. Talk about Jesus being in the boat like you did three weeks ago. Yo, it's time to start getting ready for your return. 
It's not time for me to hold your hand and say, let's all hold hands and say, kumbaya, my Lord, or let's link hands across, hands across America. No, no, this isn't about making you feel good anymore. How many people would say, it's about time we start turning the tide on COVID. It's about time we slap it down and break it in the name of Jesus. And it's about time we start planning our comeback to our jobs, to peace, to health, and back into the sanctuary. Not to go back to what we had, but to come back to a new level, a new anointing, a new breakthrough. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for the new Dom. I'm ready for the new Next City Church. I'm ready for the new Toji. I'm ready for the new Genesis draped in Telly the Monster's fur. <laughs> I got to preach to some people. Some of you are like, where's Genesis? She's behind a computer today. Look on our Facebook page because we'll put the, uh, the fleece. But here's the deal. God desires full commitment and no compromise. You're either all in, you're all out. Now Joram reaches out for Jehoshaphat, the king of Edom, and the king of Edom, and they form this alliance. And they decide to take matters into their own hands. And, and then they, they, the Bible says that they went on a path and they went on a roundabout for seven days. And they exhausted all their water, all their resources, all their energy. And it says that them and their livestock were about to die in the desert. Uh, it was their horses. It'd be like the army all of a sudden eating all their food, shoot, shooting all their bullets and, and running out of gasoline. And all of a sudden now they are rendered helpless because they don't have food to energize themselves. They don't have horses that have the energy, energy to ride. And, and they have no resource that if somebody does come against them with horses and chariots, now they are rendered useless. And it's amazing when you start to spin. How many people know you don't need to take a venture to the desert? Told you, am I too close? Tell, tell me I should, am I too close now? Am I too close now? Yeah, I need to trim my nose hairs. All right, so good. But here's the deal. You don't need to grab an alliance, go into a desert, and form an alliance with the king of Moab. All you need to do is go down a rabbit trail in your mind. Spin your resources. Try and figure out your debt. Try and figure out how we're going to get this person healed. Every one of us are guilty of taking a seven-day trip where we run about in the wilderness and we exercise our resources. Some of you got food in your refrigerator but you have not fed your soul. Because you see, chicken and beef, or for all you pescatarians, salmon, <laughs> can't feed your soul. Have you ever tried to eat yourself into comfort? And you stand in front of the refrigerator and there's everything in it, Luke, and you're like, there's nothing to eat here. <laughs> because you're emotionally in a roundabout. You're emotionally in a circle. You're emotionally in a cyclone. And you're trying to fight a battle that you were never meant to fight. You're trying to carry a weight that you were never meant to carry. You're engaged with an enemy that only God can fight. Here's my question to you right now. What do you need to drop? Because going down those trails of fighting battles you were never meant to fight will cost you more than you want to pay and keep you longer than you want to stay. I'm speaking to somebody right now that you've been trying to, you've been trying to manufacture your miracle. You've been trying to manufacture your breakthrough. You've been trying to manufacture your provision. And you've done it with hints of spirituality. Remember Ahab? He had a little bit. He took down a little bit of the altars, but he still clung to the old sins. So it's amazing. You can make your scripture pictures. You can have your prayer meetings. You could even fast until the cows come home and make yourself thinner than me. But unless the Lord builds the house, his labors labor in vain. Unless the Lord keeps watch over the city. You understand what I'm saying? And once again, I'm not just speaking to you, I'm speaking to me. Because I'm going to tell you something. I can't wait to go back to work so I don't have to work this hard. 
I feel like one day bleeds into the other. I'm tired of uh, with Toji and Ken and the team here setting up cameras and wondering, how do I look in the black? Do you like the black or do you like the tan? Should we do the tan background or should we do the black background? Genesis, should we do the green lights or should we do the purple lights? Or should we just have a splash of red, white, and blue and make it just patriotic? All cheers for the red, white, and blue. Yeah, let's do it. Should we just do it? I'm tired of being a set decorator. Rohan hanging the TV yesterday. Is it level? I don't even know. You let me know. Rohan, it's awesome. Let's give a hand for Rohan. He's the only one with sanity in our group. The rest of us are like, hey, let's put this light here. I'm tired. I'm tired not just of the setup and the technology and, and, and being the tech team with the guys because we're in the COVID colony. We can't have anybody else come and help us because we, we're afraid we're going to infect people with our just zest for life. <laughs> I'm tired of waking up every morning and finding out who's dead. I'm tired of, of another person lost or another person sick or another bad phone call from New Jersey to say nothing's changed with Adam. I'm tired because on Thursday, I felt like I was teeter-tottering or going back into pneumonia. It was weird, and I believe it wasn't just a physical attack. It was a spiritual attack. I'm just tired, and, and man, there's just so many times where you feel like you're spinning your wheels. But they that wait upon the Lord. See, and I ain't telling you this, so you can type in, Pastor, you really need to take a day off. Pastor, you should really not work so hard. Pastor, there's other people who you can call to help you out, to lift up your arms. I'm not telling you this so you can tell me how I should run my ministry that God has blessed me with. I'm telling this to you so that you understand you're not the only one who's spinning their wheels and that all of us don't need the help and opinion of others. I don't need you to tell me, Pastor, you should do this, and Pastor, you should do that, and I ain't telling you, you know what, Susie, you should do this, and you should do that. I'm telling us all, we've got to get to God. We've got to rest in Him. In, in Psalm 30, it says, In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But it also says, The Lord is waiting for those who will trust Him and wait for Him. Are you so excited to fight your battle that you have not trusted Him to wait for Him? Stephen Furtick in his palatial gym, like Apollo Creed, posted up a text this week about how he, was, how, how he would be doing pull-ups and lifting all these weights. And, and two months ago, I would have understood this, when I was going pound for pound lifting with Furtick, I haven't lifted a weight in two weeks because of stress and sickness. But don't worry, Matt, I'm coming for you, brother. But Stephen Furtick was saying about how he, uh, his friend uh, Chunks uh, told him that he was lifting too much weight, and it wasn't the weight that was bothering him, it was his grip. And how his grip, he was holding on too tight. And me and Pastor Kevin, when we go to the gym, uh, we, we, we're, we do the 40-plus-year-old workout, the old man workout. We do a set, and then we talk about which body part hurts. You know, I, you know Pastor Kevin sitting there with the, ah, Fazul, you know, the back. When I, just, when I go like this, my back hurts. And I go, you know, Kevin, when I go like that, my right glute hurts. And I'm holding my butt. He's holding his back. And anyone who looks at me, we're walking around the gym like this. Hey, what's up? Call, yeah, yeah. And the problem isn't the weight. The problem is the grip. When you grip too tight on a roller coaster, you don't enjoy the ride as it was intended to be created to in be enjoyed. What are you holding on to right now? I'm not talking about let go. But you need to let God have the control. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Is this blessing somebody? Come on, say amen. I don't know if you're with me right now. I could be preaching to two people, but if you're my mother and father, then praise God we're all in this together. The story goes on. So with no other option except defeat and death, they're forced to look for God. Here's the point. When you have no other option, that's when God can do the most. Because you've exhausted all of your options, that's when God 
has you in miracle territory. So I'm speaking to somebody right now. If you have no other option, that's exactly where God wants you. Amen? Because when there's no other option, that's when God can take over. Amen? You're in miracle territory. So for those of you who say, there's no other option, there's no other way to go, then guess what? You're right where God wants you because now he will get all the glory. Elijah in verse 14, it says, I don't have any respect for you. And then, and then it was because of, uh, of Jehoshaphat that the prophet even talked to Joram. And what you need to understand is that you are being blessed right now because of somebody else, possibly. <laughs> because of the church you go to. Because of the wife that you have. If, if you only got a little bit of Jesus and you've got blessing in your life, that's the grace of God. Don't look at everything God has given you as the fact that, you know, oh, it's all because of me. No. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for my church. I thank God that he's gracious to me better than I deserve. But I also realize that his grace points me to want to be better for him. You can't be a part-time anything. It's all or nothing. And in verse 15... It says, but now bring me a harpist. Now, now, this is important, and I know I'm rushing through this because I know our attention spans are different, and Thanos is watching from his basement, so let's figure out how we could do this, Matt. The prophet Elijah, he's going through a quandary. Has anybody ever asked you for help that was a frenemy? Has anybody ever come to you and needed help, and you couldn't stand that person? Like, all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Toji, you know, and then, uh, you know, we're minding our own business. Then all of a sudden, you know, this other guy comes over and he says, hey, listen, I'm in a jam. His name is Josh. Not our Josh, just any Josh. Josh comes over. I'm talking to Toji. Josh is like, I'm in a jam. I need some help. Uh, <laughs> I need your ministry. We need you to bury our love. And whatever the case is, you know, it comes to me. I'm the pastor. need some pastoral ministry. I need somebody to talk to. Meanwhile, I know Josh has talked about me bad behind my back. I know Josh has been mean to the people who I love. I know Josh talks about my spiritual father all the time. And now they're coming to come for help. So the minute Josh walks away, I'm going to come to Toji. Come on, Toji. Come and see everybody. Everybody say hi to Toji. He's coming with his mask. Toji's going to model his mask. Everyone want to say hi to Toji? Let's say hi to Toji. Toji's about to do an appendectomy right now. He's got his pink mask that matches, oh no, it's a purple mask. It's a purple mask that matches a, um, it's not purple, but what is it? It's a lilac shirt. Man, everybody's in the purple theme right now. So Josh comes over to me, he wants my help, and then Josh leaves. Can you believe that guy? Can you believe this guy? He wants my help? <laughs> I ain't going to help him. Now, how many people know for you to dismiss somebody just because you don't like them? And to arbitrarily feel that you've heard the voice of God is sinful. What does the Bible say? Pray for those who persecute you. Bless your enemy. If he tells you to, if he, if he needs something, give him the coat off your back. Don't just give him a shirt. Give him the coat off your back. So you know what I need to do? Bring me the harpist. Come on, harpist. Oh, you thought we just, were, we just had impromptu... Uh, uh, illustrations at church. Come on, we do it here with our crew of nine in the COVID colony. Come on, get, get your harp. All right, Toji, you can go back behind the computer. Everybody say hello to Toji, goodbye to Toji, and how much you love his lavender mask. Come on, play, play that middle song. The song you sang in the middle, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Have you ever been so angry that you couldn't make a decision about anything? Don't make decisions in anger. And, and I gain a lot from looking at the prophet's response because I realized he could have told him, no, get away from me. There's no way I'm going to help somebody who was such a, who your parents were such a thorn in the flesh of my mentor, my spiritual father. How on earth am I going to be helping these people? So he says, you know what, get the harp. And here's the problem. This is the point. When you can't make a decision, not just in anger, but when you don't know where to go, change the atmosphere and start to worship him. When Jesus said, this is how you should pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, 
Jesus says this, your prayers should not just be like this. God, I can't stand this person. Or God, help me. Or God, this is my need. No, the Bible says that when we pray, the first portion of our prayer needs to be worship. So here I am. I represent the prophet. I represent you. I represent me. And we're so vexed and we're so hurting in our, in our heart. And oh, Lord, I just can't stand this person. Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, my loved one is sick and the doctors are calling and I don't know what decision you want me to make. Lord, I don't know where my job's going to come from. That's when you need to say, get me the harpist. Now, you may not have a harpist, but you may have a guitar player. Or you may not have a guitar player, but you got an iPhone. And even if you're too cheap to buy Apple Music, you could do what Pastor Kevin does. Get it all on YouTube. I'm in the car with him the other day. I was like, you got Apple Music? He's like, no. I was like, you got, you got Amazon Music? He's like, no. Nah. I just look up the song on YouTube and I play it through my car. That's why he's rich and I'm poor. <laughs> he's like the Dave Ramsey of music. All right. So anyway, PK, you're not cheap. You're just wise. Amen. That's why there's money under your mattress right now. And me, there's only lint. All right. You may not have a harpist, but you must have a worship CD. And you know what? You don't even need a computer. You got it right here. This is your instrument. And so sing that chorus. Sing that chorus. You are. Come on, good. sing it with me right now. In the morning I sing you are good. In the evening I sing you are good. You are good to me. Yeah, but God, I, I really can't stand that person. You are good. You mean, but they're one of your children? In the morning I sing you are Good. You mean the reason they, they, the they're so I stupid is because of their insecurity? It's because they were raised you by wolves? But God, can't you find another prophet? You oh, yeah. I, good. I forgot. I know what they're In going the through, don't I? I sing you, good. you trained me for such a time the as this. I sing you, you, you want me to help them? Good. You are good to me. All right, harpist, thank you. I think I know what I got to do. Do you understand the process of worship? Sometimes we could, when we pray, we could be so set in our own agenda that we could forget about God. And what worship does is, is, is it changes the atmosphere, not just in the room, but it changes the atmosphere in our heart. It, it pushes out, you see, because the devil cannot be in the same place that God's being praised. And you need to understand that worship puts you in the mindset so that you can hear the pure voice of God. Rather than the voice of God that's crowded with your emotions and your, your own presuppositions and your own demands. The prophet understood that if he was going to make a clear decision on whether he should help this person or not, he had to worship. Here's the other thing. When somebody does ask you for your help, there is, there, is a, there is a time and a season to say no. Notice that the prophet didn't, this is for somebody right now. The prophet didn't say on the onset, yeah, I'll help you, no problem. Even though you were losing, no problem, no. The prophet didn't say yes or no. What did the prophet say? Give me the harpist. Let me get into the secret room and get with God. And then after he worshiped, he says, okay, I'll help you. And that's important for every single one of you because as you're going to return back to your life, you're going to get a lot of requests of which some should be yes, but some should also be no. And you cannot discern the decision if you are not in a place of worship where you can only hear God. And so he then is able, and thank you, Harpist. We'll have you come back at the end to sing that song again. You should have seen the harpist. He just looked at me like this. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> How many people are appreciative of Dom, amen? amen? So he says, bring me the harpist. And then he says this, make this valley full of ditches. For this is what the Lord says. Notice that worship brought the word. Oh, come on now. Somebody needs to hear this. Know that worship brought the word. It just didn't say, Elijah just didn't say, I'll help you. But worship brought the word. 
Because Elijah didn't give him his own creativity. Elijah said this. He said, he said make the valley full of dishes, ditches, <laughs> for this is what the Lord says. You will see neither the wind nor the rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you and your cattle and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also hand over Moab to you. And so now, here's the deal. God gave a word, and the word came from worship, but the test to trust that word was still in the hands of the three kings. Now I'm going to ask the harpist to come and Josh to come who talks so negatively about me. And PK, why don't you come? Here you go, Josh. Now the Bible says it was seven days. They went round about and they exhausted all their strength they exhausted all of their energy. They exhausted all of their water. And because of that, not only were they weak, but the animals that were with them to help them fight and to sustain them were all on death's doorstep. You can go without food for 21 days, but you cannot go without water more than a day or two. So what God was asking them to do, check this out was that God was asking them to give the last ounce of life that they had to dig these ditches. See, they weren't digging ditches with Gatorade in their hand. They weren't digging ditches with union breaks where all of a sudden, you know, they had, they had, uh, they had you know, excavators come and the 400. And, 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 you know, all of a sudden, Todd Hoffman and the crew are taking everything out of the ground for gold rush. No, they had, they had, they didn't even have these shovels. These are nice shovels compared to what they had. Pastor Kevin, just be careful. This will give you tetanus. All right. They didn't even have these shovels. They didn't have modern technology. You need to understand that what God was not only asking them to do was to dig the ditches, but he was asking to trust them that whatever energy they had left and whatever hydration they had left, he was asking to spend it on making receptacles for rain, that would or would not come, they had to trust him. And once again, when it comes to what you give, God's many times is like the widow. He's going to ask for the very last that you have, the last bit of hope that you have, the last bit of faith that you have, the last bit of money that you have, because he's asking you to give what you have so that he can show up with what you need. Did you catch that? He's asking you to give what you have so that he could show up with what you need. And they needed water so that they could fight the war and that they can get back the source so that they can give their offering. So they began to dig ditches. That's the sound of the men working on the chain. Come on. They're digging ditches. Good, good. And then the Bible says this. At the time of the offering. So I want you to all look like now like you're slaying the last lamb. At the time of the offering, they took some of the very last sheep that they had. And they, and they slayed it. Come on, slay an offering. What are we doing? Oh, I'm the offering? Yeah, you're the sheep. Why not? No, just kidding. All right. Give it up for them. Come on, give them a hand. This is what happens when you do church live. I'm telling you, they ain't doing this at elevation. Everything is planned out. Over here, we got cramativity. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> oh, praise God. But here's the deal. The Bible says at the time of the offering, all of a sudden, water came out of nowhere. God created a flash flood somewhere else so that it could fill this valley. Now, the thing about a flash flood is a flash flood will happen when the ground is too parched or too full to take the rain that comes. How many people know a storm someplace else is your blessing? 
And just because it's a storm and just because it's rain and just because it's a rainy day doesn't mean that God's not going to provide. How many people know even rain has its purpose? Even a storm has its purpose. Even wind has its purpose. If you've ever gone out and got your hair messed up by the wind, I'm sorry, I can't identify with you. But some of you ladies know what it's like to get your hair did. Go to the Dominican salon, get your head under the dome, and then all of a sudden you walk out. Honey, how do I look? A wind takes it away. And instead of you looking like Madonna, you look like mad, Donna. <laughs> this is quarantine humor. I've been stuck in a house with Luke for... <laughs> Sorry, this is all off the cuff. But what I'm saying is this, is that if you can't receive blessing, if your life is not primed to receive blessing, understand, rain is blessing. Without rain, the grass don't grow. Without rain, the flowers don't, the flower. And if your ground is so hard, the blessing will bounce off of you and go, ble go bless somebody else. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Rain came and a storm came and winds came in another area that was not prepared to contain it. Therefore, a flash flood happened and the rain that God sent somewhere else all of a sudden started to fill the ditches. And when did it happen? It happened at the time that they gave everything that they thought they needed to receive something that was beyond what they could ever imagine. They were able to get the water, but this is what I believe God is saying. I just went around the pulpit to come back to you. <laughs> we really need to get you back at church. I'm losing my mind. Let me do it again. Let me come back this way so I just feel good. Hi. <laughs> I'm so glad church is live. Oh, Matt's going to get me for this one. God was asking to prepare in a time where they didn't see it for something that was about to come. And some of you are saying, God, how could we prepare for tomorrow's blessing when we don't have the money, the resources, we're still in quarantine? Why is pastor preaching a message about preparing for something coming when it doesn't feel like it's coming at all? Because you see, the time for prepare was not, was, when, was not when the rain came. It was not when the floodwaters came. It was before. And when God asks you to prepare before, he'll usually ask you to give the very last of what you wanted to reserve to keep yourself for a rainy day. And I'm speaking to somebody right now. Some of you are like, I'll, I'll dig my ditch tomorrow. I'll dig my ditch next week. No, the time to dig your ditch is now. You got the last ounce of hydration in your body, start digging your ditches. You got the last ounce of hope in your heart, start digging your ditches. You got the last bit of resource in your hand, start digging your ditches. You got the last bit of health in your body, start digging your ditches. Whatever your last is, start digging your ditches. If it looks like it's impossible, that's exactly when God can come in and do the impossible. There's nothing impossible for our God. Start digging your ditches. If, the, if this is the last bit that your family has, start digging your ditches. Start digging your ditches and start believing that at the time you give, the very last of what you thought you needed, God will send you the very best of what you know you need to have. For he does exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine. I sense it in my heart. It doesn't make sense to build a ditch or dig a ditch when we're mourning over so many people in our church that have passed away. It doesn't seem like a, a time where we should be talking about even coming back into the sanctuary because they haven't even announced it yet. But I'm telling you something, start preparing. Remember how I told you before we got into this, we're going to come out of this better than we came in? Listen, I don't know exactly what the fullness of that means, but I sense it in my spirit like this Sunday, God is flipping a switch. I started to write this message last week, and then, and then, and then with Naomi's passing, I felt we needed a different message. We needed God's comfort. But some of you are saying to yourself, God, why did you do this? 
Just like they were probably saying in, in Moab, uh, I mean in Jerusalem, when the Moabites stopped with the sheep. God, why are you allowing, what, Lord, we, we got to give you this offering day and night, and they were providing it. Why are you doing this to us now? Doesn't make sense. But how many people know when life doesn't make sense, that's when you need to look to God to make sense of it. And God says, dig a ditch. You know, it's funny because when we look at Jacob, Jacob limped. And he walked through the rest of his life with a limp. And he also walked around a pulpit for no apparent reason. Jacob limped. And some of you are limping right now. But at least you can walk. Some of you are broken right now. But at least you're still alive. Some of you are desperate right now. But you know what? There's still life in your bones. Some of you, your marriage is broken right now, but at least the ring is still on your finger and the divorce papers haven't been signed. Some of you are so frustrated at your children, but at least you still have kids. Some of you don't like school, but at least you're still on the roll. Do you understand what I'm saying? Perspective. And perspective can only come when you get a word from God. And a word from God can, can, can only come when you change the atmosphere through praise and worship. And if you're not seeking God first, you will never get God's word. And if you don't get God's word, you will never get the direction to di dig your ditches. And if you don't dig your ditches, you will miss out on the blessing that God is going to send you out of nowhere. So here's the statement. The rain is coming, but is your ditch ready? The blessing is coming, but will you be ready to receive it? Are you too distracted fixing your eyes on what you don't have that you can't see what you could have? Oh, let me say it again. You are fixing your eyes on what you don't have and what you don't see or what you do see that you are not preparing yourself for what God sees. I've got to trust what God says. And then I got to realize when he asked me to do something, I'll do it afraid. And I'll trust his word. And I'll believe him from the outcome. But understand this, that at the time of the sacrifice is when God sent the rain. What is it that God is asking you to do right now? Is he asking you to give him the last bit of hope? Do it. Is he asking you to give him the last bit of trust? Do it. Is he asking you to give him the last bit of your damaged heart? Do it. Is he last asking you to give him the last bit of your finances? Do it. If he's asking you to get the last ounce of your life, do it. Because his word says that he's not a man that he should lie. God is not slow in keeping his promises as some do. Every promise of God's word is yes and amen. In Espanol, it's si y amen. <laughs> no matter what language you speak, no matter what background you come from, no matter what's happened to you, God's promise over your life is yes and amen. I'm going to ask Dominic to come. And I want you to stand all around this place. I hope when I watch this, we don't see all of a sudden, all of a sudden the views start to come down because we're at the altar time. My Lord, this is where we're responding to the Lord. Can you give me 10 minutes? Come on, we're going to end sooner than we did last week. We're working on it. <laughs> but why would I sit here and preach this word if God wasn't inviting us to a response? One of the things that we fail to do when nothing makes sense. Is we fail to give God thanks for what he has done already. On the flesh, my wife and I have been struggling with something. On Easter Sunday, God miraculously took her father off a ventilator. 
On Good Friday, they said that uh, there's nothing they can do. They don't, they don't see his uh, situation getting any better. For a week and a half, they were pushing palliative care on us. And the family said, you know what, can we, can we just have the, the Easter holiday, the weekend to pray, and then we'll talk on Tuesday. Well, from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, God took my father-in-law off of a ventilator, that which 80% of the ventilator was being used to keep him alive, by Easter Sunday being totally off the ventilator. Over the last two weeks, they have been, they have been telling us since he's been off the ventilator, that they could possibly have to put him back on. And if they put him back on, well, it doesn't look good. And I can tell you through this time, Rachel and I have been saying to God, why'd you do the miracle if you possibly could take him home again? So it's very easy to look at what God did on Easter Sunday and say, you didn't do a miracle at all. You took him off only to just bring him to heaven? So you can choose to look at that and say, well, God, you didn't really do much at all. You just kind of took him off, so what? You could torture us again? Over the last two weeks, my father-in-law has been able to talk to his family. In fact, yesterday, he was so, he was so with it and animated, not animated like, hey, how you doing? But he was able to articulate his heart. He's having a, a really hard time breathing. Only 17% of his lungs are, are working, but over the last two weeks, he's had the chance to say a couple of things. Number one, he said he, he, he felt like he saw heaven. He, he saw his wife, and he was able to articulate to us that he felt the presence of the Lord. Now, I, I know that the miracle is still not complete. It's not that God didn't do a miracle, but I, I, I choose to look at it this way. Am I going to look at God and am I going to say, and is Rachel going to look at God and is she going to say, God, why did you do this? Why did you allow him to come off the ventilator so that all of a sudden now the doctors can tell us this? Or how about this? God took him on the, off the ventilator so for the last two weeks we could talk to him. The kids have talked to him. We've had FaceTime conversations with him. And you know what? It's not the full miracle, but it's something. And I choose to say, God, thank you. Thank you for the small things. And I know the big thing is still in your hand. So honestly, for our family, we have the last bit of hope that God is asking us to give him. God, we're going to give you the last bit of hope. We're going to give you, the, we're going to give you our thanks. And when Dom sang that song, I, I just think about the last two weeks that my wife has been able to FaceTime her father. And you know what I say to that? You are good, God. Thank you, because two weeks ago, that wasn't even an option. So, Lord, I thank you that Rachel and Dom and the kids have had two weeks to say hello to Adam. And I'm believing, as I can thank him for those small miracles, that the biggest one is coming. Will you believe that with me? Come on, can you still believe that for Adam? Let's thank God for Adam in the last two weeks. Let's thank God that Mars is still alive. God, we thank you that Mars is still alive, that as long as there's breath in her lungs, there's still an opportunity for a miracle. And God, I give you thanks for that. You know, God is asking us to give him that last bit of praise that we have. Some of you feel like you can't praise God anymore. I'm going to tell you something. If you're weary, give God the last bit of praise and give him thanks. In my life, when I was going through this pneumonia, I had to thank God that, you know what, I wasn't, I, wasn't as good, I wasn't as good as I could feel, but every day as I was getting better, I had to thank God. You know what, at least I'm not as bad as I was. Some of you have some big reasons to give thanks right now. Some of you, the job called and says, you know what, we, <laughs> we don't have any more room for you. You got to file for unemployment. So you know what you do? You give God the last bit of praise. You give him the last bit of whatever you have, and you say to him this, not God, how can you do this to me? But God, you are good. Can we do that right now? Listen, I know that there's probably some of you that are living on cloud nine right now. You're getting all the money you need. You're getting all the...
toilet paper you need. You you got Clorox wipes coming out uh, out your garage, and you know you got nothing going on in your life right now. So then you know what? If it's all well with your soul, help praise with us. But there's a bunch of us in New York City right now that are limping. We're tired of hearing bad news from the doctor. We're tired of hearing bad news from the economy. We're tired of hearing that this quarantine could last until 2022. You know, we're tired of everything, and and, and it's like we're empty. We're tired of seeing people die. There's some healthcare workers right now that are so weary because they see death every day. There's a nurse that don't want to go to work today because she doesn't want to see another person die. There's a doctor right now that's so frustrated that he's looking at somebody not as a person but as an object and he needs that humanity and compassion restored to him and that hasn't happened to you intentionally but you're war tattered. You're torn. You're like that eagle where you're fed. There's somebody right now. Your last bit of hope is all you have. Your last bit of courage is all you have. Your last bit of this is all you you have and what God is asking you to do is stop looking at what you don't have and start giving him praise and thanks for what you do have. You got a little bit of a marriage, praise him for it. You got a little bit of kids, praise him for it. You got a little bit of hope, praise him for it and thank him that he is good because when you can focus on what you have, God will send you what you need. The rain is coming. Start digging your ditches. Start preparing for the answer, because God has spoken to you today, and he wants to send you his blessing. So can you stand with me? Come on, husband, lead your family right now. Tell the kids to stand up. Tell your wife Gertrude to stand up. Get your family up. Get grandma up. Get grandpa up. And lift up your hands. Don't be ashamed of him. And I'm going to ask Dom to sing it, and we're going to sing that song, You Are Good. You are good, and when we say you are good, we're going to give them that last bit of whatever we're holding on to that we have, and we're going to lay it before him as an offering, and then we're going to believe that the rain is going to come, and the miracles are going to happen, that Adam is going to walk out of that hospital, that Marsh is going to walk out of that hospital, that you are going to be healed, that you are going to be saved, that this is not the end, it's only just begun. Dom, can you lead us? Yes, thank you. Come on, stand all around this place. All around your home. Let's sing it to him. Thank you. You are good, you are good. Mm -hmm. You are good. In the morning I sing you. You are, are good, you are good. good. In the evening I sing you. Are good. You are good to me. Come on, lift up your hands wherever you are. Type it in and just say, Lord, I thank you that you're good. You are good. In the morning I sing you are good. In the evening I say you are good. You are good to me. Come on, what's the next part? Sing it. Let's, all, let's worship him together. You keep on getting better. Come on. You keep on getting better. Hallelujah. You keep on. You keep on getting better. You keep on getting better. Oh, you keep on keeping on. You keep on getting better. You keep on getting better. Hallelujah. You keep on getting better. You keep on. You keep on. Come on. Give him that last bit. Start digging. Keep on getting better. The best is coming. The best is yet to come. Keep on getting better. Keep on getting better. Oh, you keep on getting better. You keep on getting better. You are, you are. Come on, every good. voice. In the morning I sing. Come on, are you singing it at home? Lift up your hands. Good. You are good. You are good. In the you are evening good. I sing. You are good. You are good to me. One more time, you are good. You are good. In the morning I sing, you are good. In the evening I sing, you are good. You are good to me. I'm going to ask, uh, you know, keep it COVID, keep it. In the Pastor Kevin, Rachel, Toge, would you come up here? Come on. 
just spread up around here. I want you to understand there's more than me preaching this message to you. There's been a team of people interceding. Yeah. Don't worry, this is six feet. I'll stand here. Every one of these people are picking up their shovel and they're digging the ditches. Pastor Kevin had COVID-19. He and Heidi both. Could you imagine what that's like in a house where you got two young ones and both parents are out and trying to figure out how we're going to take care of the kids when there's no, there's no, no one of our in-laws that could come in and take care of the kids because they'll get it. And I'm sure that there were times in his battle with COVID-19 and the breathing where he just had to say, Lord, you know what? I don't know how this is going to happen, but I trust you. And I could tell you just knowing Pastor Kevin and Heidi, they dug their ditches. And God sent his rain. I could tell you that my wife Rachel right now is holding on to the last bit of hope. Last week, one of her closest friends was taken away from her. And many of you are feeling the loss of Naomi. But now, as we, every day, when I ask her, how's your father? How's your father? Well, he's talking, and he's, he's, he's letting us know he wants to live, but the doctors are telling him that he should prepare for the end of his life. So I got a, I got a wife, and we have a family that it feels like we, got, we just got a little bit more hope, a little bit more that we're saying, God, we just, we don't know how much more of this we can take. It has been almost two months of constant prayer for her father. And she said to me the other day, Dom, I just feel like I'm being dragged over the coals. But you know what? We got a little bit of hope left in our family. So we're going to use that hope to dig the ditch and prepare, prepare for the rain. Amen. Toji and his wife, Anna, they have been such an incredible blessing over the last couple of months. They've been taking me and other people to the doctors. I'm sorry, I know I can't touch you. Let me put a COVID hand on your shoulder. There we go. So nobody calls the COVID police. He's taken me and so many other people to the, hosp to the hospital, to the doctors. Him and Anna always available. But they were doing it with their own needs. And you know what they were doing? They were digging ditches, helping other people. I told you I want to tell you something. And Anna, you've been digging ditches for other people. And God's going to send you the rain. God's going to send you the rain. God's going to send you the rain. And this guy over here, he, him and Genesis are the only people we can use for worship because they both had COVID. The rest of the worship team, apparently, you're drinking bleach, bleach like the president said. No, don't, don't drink bleach. Don't tell me that. Don't send me no letters. Don't drink bleach. Drink Diet Cherry Coke Zero. It kept me clean. It'll do you good. No? <laughs> I hope Coca-Cola sends me a case of it. But son, I know you're not up here because you want to be. You're up here because you're the last person that I could count on. Because everyone else is sick. And you know what? It's been amazing to see as you've been digging the ditches. God has been giving you anointing. Amen. I can't even sing with you because your voice sounds too good. I realize how horrible I am and how in tune you are. It's sickening that God has given you this gift. And I can't wait to see what God does. You know, you're digging ditches right now for what God's about to expose you to in college. You got in the last two months what you could have, you could have only gotten with a year of UVF. And you know what? So what? High school is, you're not going to get the graduation you thought. You're not going to get the last couple of weeks where everybody signs the yearbook and puts KIT, keep in touch, and you never hear from them again until they stalk you on Facebook like a creep. You've been digging ditches for your future. And I'm so glad for you. Ken, you've been digging ditches. Because you've been here every Saturday helping me with the designs. And all these guys have been. All the people. Anna, Genesis, Kendall, and all of you at home. I don't know. I don't know what's left. But whatever's left, use it for God. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone who's watching right now. Whatever's left... We dig our ditch with it because we're preparing for the rain that's coming. Marriage is healed. Lives healed. People were praying for healed. And God, COVID to be ended once and for all in Jesus' name. And thank you, God, that we're not going to come back to normal. We're going to come back to better than before. I pray that over every household, every individual, everyone that's discouraged, I thank you that there's still hope. That, Lord, that whatever's left in them, they would give you praise. They would honor you and trust your word. Can you say it right now? God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I trust you at your word. I honor you. I bless you. 
and I give you whatever you're asking of me. And if there's anyone who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we'll pray this right now. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. I give you everything. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, cleanse me of all unrighteousness, and come live in me. Now you're my Savior. Heaven is my home. And we'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said amen and amen. This message is not just about what we respond to here. This message is about how you live your week now. I'm giving you all your shovel. God spoke his word to you. Now do what he told you. Start digging because the rain is coming. I love you. We love you. We're so honored to serve you through this time. And I want to say to you that the best is yet to come.